Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Hallsboro County in New Hampshire, a Bigfoot shook the camper van where Gerald St. Louis and his two sons, Alan and James, were sleeping. Mr. St. Louis opened the door and turned on the lights and saw the creature face to face. It was eight to nine feet tall, hairy and brown colored with long arms. The lights startled it and it stepped over a four and a half foot tall fence with ease. Then it just stood in the distance and looked at them. The family were so scared that they left immediately without the goods they were planning to sell the next day. They returned with the police but saw no Bigfoot. Gerald St. Louis was staying at the site of a local flea market. He woke up and witnessed the creature responsible. I saw it face to face. It was all hairy, brown-colored, and eight or nine feet tall, with long arms and long hair. Thank God for the light, for it apparently startled the creature, and it ran towards the fence, about four and a half feet high, and jumped over it with ease. I could see it standing there in the distance, just looking at us. Tracks of 16 inches long by 8 inches wide were found. Police are awaiting the return of a Lowell, Massachusetts man identified only as Mr. St. Louis after he reported seeing a 10-foot-tall hairy monster Saturday night at Hollis Flea Market. Chief Paul Bossett said the man came into police headquarters at about 10.30 Saturday and reported the strange incident. St. Louis told the dispatcher that his wife and two sons were sleeping in their pickup truck on the flea market grounds when they were awakened by the shaking of the truck. The man said he looked out and saw what he described as a 10-foot-tall hairy animal with human-like features shaking the truck. The Lowell man quickly started his truck and sped off to the police station, where he reported the incident. Police went to the scene, but could find no evidence of the animal. Bosquet said the area in which the truck was parked, was covered with pine needles, and no footprints could be found. St. Louis was scheduled to set up an area in the flea market Sunday, Bosquet said, but he did not return on that day and left a trailer at the site. He has not been seen or heard of from since. The Hollis chief said the animal may have been a bear that came out of nearby woods in search for food from a nearby rubbish container. On to the next one. In October, a hunter had told of seeing two strange beasts walking across a field next to Mill Brook. Mr. Walter Bauer Sr. sensed that he was being watched while he was hunting in the area near Southbury in New Hampshire. He then saw something standing between two groups of trees that was at least nine feet tall and covered with grayish colored hair. The sun was in Mr. Bauer's eyes, and he could not make out the creature's face, but he could see that the hands were human-like, but three times larger. The hairy humanoid ran into a swamp, and Mr. Bowers ran to his car and sped away. Friday, November 13th, French Concord Monitor. The man who spied Bigfoot comes forward. Walter Bauer Sr., a man of sound mind and sober spirit, swears he saw Bigfoot while hunting pheasant in Salisbury three weeks ago. He told the chief of police, who told the boys at the Crossroad County store, who laughed their fool heads off. Now ask yourself this, why would Bowers, a retired caretaker at the New Hampshire Veterans Home, make up such a story? Why would he subject himself to such ridicule? I don't like to be made a fool of, he said, but I know what I saw. Bowers stepped forward after reading about the uproar his story had created in Salisbury. He agreed to take me out to the field where he saw whatever he saw. 
Maybe we could find some tracks in the snow. It don't bother me any to go out with you, he said. But I'm not going to go unarmed. Not after I see what that thing is. He grabbed me at his trailer on Pheasant Street in Webster with a three fifty seven Magnum strapped to his hip. I'm not going to shoot it, he said, but I'm not going to let it get a hold of me either. Snow squalls darkened the sky as we scrunched into my car and headed for Southbury, talking all the way. Bauer, 53, is a lifelong resident of Webster. He started hunting when he was old enough to carry a gun. Now retired, he likes to hunt pheasant in a field known as Bob's Big Interval, next to Mill Brook in Southbury. About three weeks ago, a hunter from Warner told Bowers he had seen two strange beasts walking across the field early one morning. I didn't pay much attention, Bowers said. I just went out bird hunting two days, three days afterward. As he crossed the field with his 12-gauge shotgun shortly after daybreak, he had a strange feeling he was being watched. He passed between two stands of trees, turned to the right, and there he was, standing right out in the middle of the field. Bigfoot? Sasquatch? Whatever you want to call it. This thing was big, he said. I would say at least nine feet, maybe less, maybe more, because I didn't stick around too long to do any measuring. The whole body was covered with hair. I would say it was kind of a grayish color from where I was standing. Of course, the sun was coming up facing me, but it wasn't that bright. The face, I couldn't make out that good. The hands were like yours or mine, only three times bigger, with pads on the front paws like a dog, long legs, long arms. It was just like, I would say, like a gorilla. But this here wasn't a gorilla. I'm telling you, it would make your hair stand up. After a few moments, the creature ran off toward the large swamp behind the field. Bowers hustled back to his car, glancing over his shoulder to make sure he was alone. A few nights later, he told Southbury Police Chief Jody Heath, a family friend, that he had seen and asked if he could shoot the beast if it attacked him. Heath, biting his lip, promised to find out. He sounded like everybody else, Bowers said. I don't think he really believed me. Bowers tried the game warden next. He just laughed at me, he said. There's no such thing. He said it was probably a bear or a moose. I said, look, I can tell the difference between a bear and I can tell the difference between a moose. This was neither. He didn't believe me. He got mad and hung up. Bowers has shot four bears in his lifetime so he knows what they look like. As for moose, has anyone ever seen one standing on its hind legs and walk like a man? If a man can't tell the difference between a moose and a thing like that, Bowers said, he hadn't ought to be hunting whatsoever, not in my book. He hadn't ought to be in the woods hunting if he can't tell the difference. Hundreds of people have reported seeing half-human creatures like Bigfoot, usually in the vast forests of the Pacific Northwest and Asia. Bowers figures creatures like the one he saw live and die in swamp caves where no man can find them. They probably come out in the morning to look for apples or corn or whatever it is they eat. I think there's more people that see these that are not saying anything because they don't want to be laughed at, he said. One of these days, he may use his camera to stake out the area using apples for bait. A clear photo of the animal or its tracks might convince the skeptics. Until then, he figures people can have a good laugh at his expense. Go ahead, he said, shaking his head, but it's not going to change a thing, because I still saw what I saw. On to the next one. In January of 1894, in the area around Mine Hill in Morris County near Dover, New Jersey, Numerous individuals saw a big, whiskered, hairy wild man that was apparently middle-aged, nearly six feet tall, and 180 pounds in weight. During one sighting, the witnesses attempted to capture him, but he fought them off with a club, and when one of the dogs sprang at him, it received a blow that nearly killed it. 
The witnesses were Bertha Hedig, Lizzie Guscott, Katie Griffin, Mike Dean, Bill Dean, William Mullins, and others. Three mill girls had initially seen the creature and shrieked so loud and long that the businesses of the mill and nearly the whole town came to a standstill. The creature gave an answering shriek of terror and took off to the woods. Hounds that belonged to two brothers who were woodcutters, Bill and Mike Dean, cornered the wild man, which was a savage-looking figure with a face thickly covered with dark, unkempt hair. The varmint then looked savagely at the woodchoppers for an instant and then sprang to the rocks where it picked up a club and brandished it. One of the dogs sprang at him and received a blow that nearly killed it. The brothers fled to the company store and used the telephone to call for help. A search party was organized by 50 men scouring the mountains, found no trace of it. On to the next one. I first became aware that the Bigfoot species is real when I was 13 years old and lived just outside of Ashland, Oregon. I was always very passionate about wildlife, spending a lot of my time in my youth watching all sorts of BBC shows and anything and everything that was narrated by David Attenborough. So naturally, I spent a lot of time outside, even when it was pouring rain. I loved to throw on a poncho and walk around on the trails near my house. There was something about that feeling that was so magical. I can't even describe it. This one summer, I had become particularly interested in this one type of caterpillar. There was such an infestation of them that they would often fall from the trees where they were nesting. I remember how I was scooping up a couple of them to put in a jar when I realized they had fallen what looked to be an enormous footprint. The track was so pronounced that I knew right away I had stumbled upon something miraculous. As I turned my attention forward, I noticed that wasn't the only track in the area. I was able to locate about two or three others. However, the initial track was the most prominent. I got a little overly excited and ran back to my house to get my dad to come back there with me to check it out. By the time we got there, which was only maybe 20 minutes later, I was unable to relocate the track. I was so frustrated at that moment because I could tell my dad thought I had imagined it. It's not like I blame him for that. Would you believe a 13-year-old child about that sort of thing? One who is obsessed with anything that has to do with the wilderness. Even though I couldn't find the track, I still had this feeling that there was for sure something highly unusual roaming around the area. My dad could tell I was frustrated about whatever I thought I had seen and poke a little more fun at me. He remarked how maybe I should get a pair of night vision goggles so that I'd be able to see whatever was out there. Even though he was joking, it made a lot of sense to me and that was what I'd end up asking for as my birthday gift, which was only a few weeks after that. As soon as I received those goggles, I spent a lot of time camping in the pitch black night. I did my best to refrain from using any lights that would draw attention to my whereabouts, as I wanted to observe the natural habitat with minimal forms of human intrusion. It surprised me now to think about how my parents would allow me to be out there all by myself. I suppose they thought I was close enough to the house that I would be safe. But even though they didn't believe in Bigfoot, I'm not sure they were confident a cougar wouldn't take its chances with me. I spent many nights out there without anything through the goggles that appeared to be out of the ordinary. I'll estimate that it must have been over 10 nights. Still, I kept my belief going strong and continued to camp outside any chance I got. I have to be honest, it's kind of crazy to think how determined I was to spot one of these creatures in the wild. What I thought I was looking for 
ended up being quite different in reality. There was this one night when I was lying in my tent and reading a Harry Potter book when I heard something that didn't make too much sense. It was around 11 p.m., and it sounded like a robin was chirping somewhere within the vicinity. From what I knew, robins didn't chirp at night. Since I was reading, I did have a little nightlight switched on. That likely helped whatever was in the area to be aware of my presence. The thing is, if I hadn't known that robins were inactive at nighttime, I wouldn't have even thought to put the goggles on at that time. When I did a 360 scan of the environment, I soon landed on a very peculiar figure. It appeared as though I was looking at a giant human, but the arms appeared to be about twice as long. It was right then and there that I knew I was looking at whatever was responsible for the footprints, and even though I was obviously intrigued as well as satisfied that my hunch had been correct, I was also overcome with nervousness. That nervousness didn't come from my excitement. It came from fear. I somewhat wanted to lower the goggles from my face, but I also wanted to be sure that the figure was not interested in coming too much closer. As I looked at it for a few minutes, the figure would sporadically sway, almost like its body was convulsing. Then, something incredibly strange happened. I watched as a second figure stepped out from behind the first one. It was previously so hidden that it was almost like the first figure had cloned itself right before my eyes. Because of the colors displayed in the night vision goggles, the sight reminded me of what it looked like when cells split beneath a microscope. My fear exponentially increased when the second figure appeared to drop down on all fours and run to the left side of the first figure. The first figure continued to stand in the same place. I know it was reckless, but the closest thing I ever carried to a weapon while camping was a Swiss army knife. Since it was all that I had, I steadily reached for it while simultaneously trying to keep sight of the figure that was now moving very quickly around me. It started to become clear that the second figure was closing in on my tent, and I foolishly yelled out the words, Stay away! The second figure ceased all movement, but when I tried to locate the first figure, I couldn't see anything near where it originally stood. It suddenly felt as though they were toying with me. It was like they knew I was watching them, but how could the creatures have any idea that I had been watching them through the night vision goggles? It wasn't long after that that I could hear these long, deep breaths only a few feet away from my tent, and they came from off to my left. That noise startled me so bad that I lost grip of the goggles and they fell onto the fleece blanket that lay below my knees. It was then that I regretted spending the night out there. It also felt like a miracle to me that I had survived all those previous nights untouched. It was any second that I thought I was going to get crushed within my tent, but the breathing continued from the same place. I couldn't tell if the creature was waiting for me to make a move or was merely observing me. Either way, I started to get the impression that the creature wasn't starving. Otherwise, I'd already have been dead. I'm a bit embarrassed that I just sat there shaking, but I was only 13 years old. I would have been snapped like a twig by creatures of that size without any room to struggle. I'm not sure how long I sat there frozen, but the breathing was interrupted by faint dialogue that emanated from maybe 40 yards beneath me. At first, I thought a couple of foreign men had walked into the vicinity and were possibly even hunting the creatures. And then, as one of the voices turned into a very animalistic-sounding grunt, it dawned on me that these organisms have an intricate speech of their own. 
I think that the mimicking of animal noises is intended to help them blend in with the natural environment. I wonder if they only do it when they suspect that humans are nearby to keep people thinking that nothing is out of the ordinary. Of course, some people have been trained to notice that sort of thing. I'm a bigger believer that if you spend enough time in the wilderness, you do indeed sharpen your senses to the point where you almost always know when something is off. As everything fell completely silent, I failed to spot either of the creatures through the night vision goggles. That's something that still stumps me to this day. How could they have been that fast to get out of the area? The only other theory I can come to is that I was in such an intense state of shock that much more time than I had realized passed before I quietly returned the bulky goggles to my eyes. I so badly wanted to be back in my bed, as I'm sure you can understand, but I was way too afraid to move. I was relieved when the sun finally came out, but there is still no way I can be sure that those beings weren't near my tent. There was something about them that felt almost supernatural. It was like I had lived through a scene in a sci-fi movie. It was difficult to conceptualize. When I made it back to my house, the first thing I did was wake my parents up and tell them all about what I had just been through. As I said those words out loud, the more I realized it wasn't helping them to believe my case. It's crazy how all of this has been going on so close to them, and that these creatures have been among us, yet they found the notion of Bigfoot to be ridiculous. It makes me question how many cases like that are going on not only in the United States, but around the globe. Since I had originally found those tracks so close to the house, I was confident that if I stayed up late and surveyed the property with my night vision goggles, I'd see at least something noteworthy. Then I would be able to prove it to my parents. I remember feeling so determined to prove at least something to them. When I think back on it, I think it was because I wanted somebody else to feel what I had been feeling the chilling epiphany that these beings are part of our reality. I was frustrated when many weeks passed by before I again saw even a hint of strange activity, and what I saw wasn't enough to show my parents. Even if I had had an adequate time to summon them, while I was sitting on my back porch, I saw what looked like a blob gliding through the trees, maybe somewhere around 80 yards out. It was weird, because it looked like it was flying below the trees, and at times it seemed to almost take on a human form before returning to a blob form. I know that sounds so weird, but I don't know how else to put it. I don't think I even told my parents about that sighting, because I felt all it would do was further influence them to undermine everything I had been saying. If I remember correctly, it was only the following night when I put on the night vision goggles and saw one of the figures within the vicinity, even though I was scared, I was excited and I speed walked over to my parents' bedroom to get them. It ended up being a huge mistake for me to get them. After I dragged my dad into my bedroom to look out the window, he tossed the goggles away from his face and ran out the back door yelling at the mysterious being. I should have known that he would have perceived them to be human trespassers. I felt rather irresponsible at that moment, as my mother and I yelled for him to get back inside. We noticed that he went silent. He would be the first of us to see what these things looked like from head to toe. That was when all of the ear-piercing screams began. For a few moments, it was as if there were a group of ladies in the backyard screaming like they were all getting stabbed with kitchen knives. It was the most horrific noise. I do my best not to think too much about it. Worried that something was about to happen to my father, 
my mother ran outside, intending to guide him back into the house. She also must have seen the trespassers because her scream was very distinct compared to theirs. She must have suspected that I was about to come outside because she immediately screamed at me to stay where I was. When both my parents made it inside and locked the door, my mother rushed for the telephone and called the police. As we waited for them to get there, my dad passed me the night vision goggles after he turned them on and saw nothing there. It was strange how they still sounded like they were close, but he said he saw the figures way off in the distance past the woods. Strangely enough, when the police arrived, the creatures were still in the vicinity, hollering up a storm. They were so noisy that it made all of us wonder how we had never heard anything like it before. We concluded that it was a family of Bigfoot and that this must have been the first time that they migrated through our area. Both police officers walked into the backyard with my goggles and took a peek. They confirmed that they did see what looked like a group of individuals strolling through the woods, but that they appeared to be off the property, so there was nothing they could do. My dad quickly found that story to be fishy, and to this day, he insists that those officers knew the truth about what we had encountered. They just didn't want to speak the truth because it probably went against protocol. They could hear the noises of the creatures, which by that point had transitioned into what sounded like bickering. I think my dad's hunch is accurate because those policemen clearly had no interest in going out there to confront those so-called men. I remember hoping that they would at least fire a warning shot into the air so that the beings would think twice before coming back to our land, but they did no such thing. Before leaving, they reassured us they would send someone to the other side of our property to intercept the group of intruders. Whether that was true or not, I cannot say. All I know is that those two fellows did not want to get close to them. I've always wondered if they merely left the whole thing alone or if they did call in for reinforcements that were more equipped to handle that sort of thing. After that night, things were still weird around the house for quite a while. My parents often debated whether we should move away from the area, but as time went on without any additional incidents, we all began to settle back into a fairly normal routine. My dad even ended up getting a second pair of night vision goggles so that we could both keep watch once the sun went down. Maybe the police officers were telling the truth when they said they would handle things, although I never heard any gunshots or anything like that at any point. We only lived in that house for another year or so before we moved to Colorado for other reasons. There's a large part of me that's disappointed I never got to see what these beings looked like. Both of my parents get a little uncomfortable when we talk about it, especially my mom, but they both agree that the creatures looked like oversized humans covered with long, shaggy, dark hair. My dad also always makes a point to say that their eyes were spread unusually far apart. Still, my parents saw them in very poor light so they could only perceive certain details, and understandably, it was such a traumatic experience for both of them that they were probably much more focused on getting away from the intruders than anything else. For some reason, it was a big deal to me when my dad apologized for not believing that I had found those tracks while I was examining caterpillars. I think it's safe to assume that none of us will ever reside in a heavily wooded area again. On to the next one. Artie and I met during boot camp. Artie's real name is Arto, which he told me means bear man in Finnish. I thought it rather remarkable that his entire family was of pure Finnish heritage. All of his family had migrated to the United States in the late 1800s and all lived together in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan 
in Alger County. During boot camp, Artie and I hit it off well. Whenever we could get a moment to sit and talk, we did. Over time, I learned that he and I had quite a lot in common. The two of us shared a great love for the outdoors. We both fished and we both liked to shoot. However, he was a hunter and I had never hunted per se, preferring to spend my time shooting sporting clays. During this time in the service, we agreed to visit each other on our home turfs after the military gig was finished. In the summer, I packed up my truck and headed to Artie's house in Michigan. I had made a point to pack my 12-gauge semi-auto Beretta, which Artie had advised would be needed for protection. When I asked him what we would be protecting ourselves from, he said that bears were the primary problem. I thought this was fair enough, though I wondered what else may also be living there. I spent two days cruising up into his neck of the woods, and when I started getting close, everything was all woods. To me, this place was like the primeval forest. I mean, there were only gravel and dirt roads surrounded by thick, predominantly pine forests, and I could only occasionally catch sight of a house or building. After having been turned around numerous times, I finally found their hacienda. It was quite the spread, consisting of one large house and a smaller one, both surrounded by a number of barns and outbuildings. I pulled into the driveway and hit the horn. Suddenly, it was as if I was in the middle of a family reunion. People, both young and old, were springing out from every which way. They were greeting me as if I was a prodigal son returning home, and I thought to myself, this was going to be a great time. After the initial meet and greet, I was given the nickel tour of the homestead. One of the barns was like a machine or a blacksmith shop, and these dudes had everything. Apparently, Great Grandpa made a lot of the metal tools and goods, both for himself and the surrounding residents back in the day. Another barn was loaded with professional lumber yard and milling equipment. As it turns out, his family had harvested much of the lumber that their home and the homes of many other families in the area were made out of. These folks were made from the real stock. They knew what to do and how to do it, and they were proud of it. As the day continued into night, Artie shared the itinerary for the next nine days. His plan was for us to first tour around and see the surrounding sites, followed by some camping, hiking, and fishing in the truest wilderness style. It all sounded great to me. After dinner had been prepared and eaten, which, by the way, was served up in true Thanksgiving style. His father had taken me into the den to peruse the family's gun collection. They had three gun cabinets lining the room. Each cabinet had been handcrafted as the collection grew, and all their wood had aged differently, one looking more beautiful than the next. They had 47 rifles and shotguns, and the drawers beneath the cabinets were stocked with handguns. To tell you the truth, I had not seen many guns before, but these were so fine that they could be a museum collection. To top it all off, the family knew everything about each gun, and I do mean everything. We spent two hours or so just in front of the gun cabinet talking. I was receiving an education in each firearm's history, who made them and the country they came from, it was at this time that Artie pulled out a large handgun saying, Allow me to introduce you to Harry. It was a forty four caliber that he had bought after seeing the Clint Eastwood detective exploit in Dirty Harry. That sucker was a hand cannon, not a handgun. And Artie said that in the morning we could shoot it. This gun was obviously his baby. After the next morning's breakfast, we went outside with Harry in hand. We must have shot a hundred rounds. My hands hurt, my shoulders hurt, and my ears were ringing. 
What a beast that thing was. We then walked over to one of the buildings, which we had not been in yesterday. As Artie swung the doors open, there she was, a huge beast of a monster truck. It was metal flake blue and glistening like a star. It had a cap of the same color and, on both sides, was sprayed with the name Littlefoot. In retrospect, the choice of the name seemed almost foreboding. It was his version of the original monster truck Bigfoot, made with a 69 Ford F-250 and powered by what he said was a blown 428 engine. He had installed all kinds of blocks and shackles under the body and had added everything and anything you could imagine to make the truck reach for the sky. The exhaust system consisted of headers going into cherry bomb mufflers and when he fired it up in the barn, the timbers shook. The cab was accessible by billet aluminum steps and handrail. This truck was like an adult carnival ride. It was unbelievable. And for the duration of my stay, Littlefoot was our primary mode of transportation. Artie took me everywhere, and I learned everything there was to know about the region. It had been a tremendous logging area. And up until just after World War II, copper mining had also been a huge industry. He told me that the local mines had produced more mineral wealth than the California gold rush. He also said that the forests were packed with black bears, wolves, moose, deer, gray foxes, red foxes, bobcats, porcupines, hares, rabbits, and everything else you could imagine. No wonder he told me to bring my shotgun. We took a boat ride to see Miner's Castle and the pictured rocks, which were gigantic and beautiful glacial formations. Most of what we were seeing and doing was in an area called Munising. He brought me deep into areas of the woods there. I don't remember if all of the forest was called Iwatha or just a section of it, but it really doesn't matter. All the woods were the same, vast and dense, without a soul to be seen. There were waterfalls, both small and large, located here and there. Artie said that something like 2 or 3% of the state's total populace lived in this area, even though it presented a third of the state's total landmass. People were a sparse commodity here. After two days of running around and having a blast, we returned to the Raikkonen homestead to prepare for our camping, hiking, and fishing adventure. Out in the barn, Artie took a small step ladder and placed it by the rear of Littlefoot. He opened the tailgate and the cap. He had already hooked us up with everything we'd need in the bed. There was a fire extinguisher, a shovel, a chainsaw, a first aid kit, and a variety of ropes. He said that one of the ropes was to hoist our perishable foods into the trees, so the area's bears wouldn't get wind of them. He also had two large water jugs, the kind you see at a Little Leaguer's game, and a large cooler that we were going to fill with only ice. The rest of our supplies were canned items and some dry goods, as well as a case of Gatorade bottles and more than a few brews. On the interior side of the bed, Artie had built some racks made of wood. On one side, there was a rack for long guns, and on the other side of the bed, there was a rack for fishing rods. He had already put in a pair of fly rods and several spinning rigs. He even had electric winches on the front and rear of the truck. Hanging around here was like being in the fire department. Having prepared ourselves with everything humanly imaginable, we took off. Artie said that we were heading to an area near the O-Train Lake and River. The way in was fairly long consisting of a decent dirt road which led into some real four-wheeler paths. We had to break out the chainsaw in the truck on two occasions to clear some down timber from the trail. And it was clear to me that no vehicle had been in here for a very long time. The trees we had cleared must have been laying there for years. The whole traveling ordeal took us about two hours before we finally reached a small, somewhat clear area where we could set up camp. Now, when I say clear, 
It was more or less an opening in the standing pines with debris scattered everywhere. Artie said that many areas had been replanted after the logging industry had ravaged a fair amount of the forest, which led a hodgepodge of young and old pines occupying the same place. We set up camp and dug a fire pit, which really didn't take us much time at all. Once we were done, Artie said that there was still plenty of time left in the day for us to head down to the river and catch some trout. So we grabbed the fly rods, Artie took Harry, and I grabbed my shotgun before we started walking and walking and walking. Just so you understand, at this stage of my life, a long walk for me was going in and out of the mall, with a two-mile bike ride sprinkled in from time to time. My legs were shot, but Artie told me that we were getting close to our destination. He knew this because the forest started to tighten up. There were a lot of smaller trees and bushes as we got closer to the water source, and there was no longer anything resembling a trail. We were looking for breaks in the growth and fighting our way through the bramble when we suddenly broke free of it all and spotted the river. Now, we are not talking about the Colorado here. You could easily walk across this river. In fact, I looked up and down as far as I could. I could see many of the tree branches flanking the river's edge were not more than eight or ten feet from touching the branches on the other side. Additionally, this river was strewn with wood and rocks. It was relatively calm flowing water, and as I began to focus on the surface, I could see that there was plenty of trout to be had. We began to fish. The two of us were using terrestrials, which are flies that are tied to look like a variety of insects. Because of the tightly spaced trees, you really couldn't cast much from anywhere in here. We were more or less flipping and mending the flies into position. We must have been fishing quietly for several hours, enjoying the company of ourselves and the fish. It was really beautiful, and I was more relaxed here and now than I had been in a very long time. I had almost zoned out of existence when I started to hear a loud rock clacking noise. To me, it sounded as though it had to be very close. I turned my head to look at Artie, and we made eye contact. He shrugged. We kept fishing, and the sound kept happening. It sounded like two rocks cracking together against something being smashed. There was a distinct crunch. It reminded me more of breaking a mussel shell than a clam shell, since a mussel's shell is much softer and thinner, and makes a more crunching sound when broken. As the sounds continued, the two of us began to slowly walk towards each other. I was trying to look in the sound's direction, but because of the tightness of the river with the overhanging branches and the river's curvy nature, it was impossible to see very far. The source of the noise could have been 40 feet away, and we would still be unable to see it. When we got close to each other, we whispered so quietly that we might as well have been lip-syncing. Artie thought it may have been moose antlers clacking together, and that the noise may well have been much further away than it sounded. Somewhat reassuredly, I slowly moved back to the pool I had been fishing in, but this time... I made a point to position myself a little closer to the bank and my 12-gauge. After a little while, the noise stopped. But now, I could hear something moving about in the brush, and it started to freak me out. I could see Artie craning his neck as well, fighting to see movement in the trees. We came together again, deciding to wait it out a little bit longer, and then split hoping that whatever was moving around would head on out of here while we waited. As we began fighting through this brush on the way out, I was really on edge. I expected something to get the jump on us at any moment, and between holding the gear and shoving trees around, there wouldn't be much time to mount and shoot if needed. I started to think of my old friend Dave. 
I had met Dave, or Fat Dave as I called him, in a parking lot by a lake. I used to go there to study in my car, and I would see Dave and some other guys who were always there. They fished with light tackle and worms, catching bluegills and sunfish, while getting out of the car to stretch my legs and talk to them. I found out that he was from Florida, and I could see a large scar circumventing almost his entire shoulder. I happened to be studying for the medical field, so I asked him what type of surgery he had. He told me that while on tour, he was on sentry duty, walking back and forth on the campus perimeter. He and another soldier would walk in a half circle and meet again in the middle, going back and forth over and over again. As he was walking, he heard a twig snap, and as quickly as he turned, an enemy soldier already had a bayonet buried in his shoulder. As he tried to move, the soldier kept forcing the blade around in him. He had been falling to the ground when, instinctively, he mustered up his M16 with his one good arm and emptied the entire clip into the sky, killing him. And emptied his entire clip into the sky, killing him. Anyway, I felt the same way right now. All the way back to camp, I couldn't shake an eerie feeling out of my spine, and the forest was deathly quiet. You could barely hear us walking, let alone anything else. Finally, we reached the camp, and I began to make a fire while Artie stepped behind some trees to take care of business. A few moments later, I heard a startled shout. What the heck is that? I walked over to see. He stood looking at a large snake on the ground, which had knots tied on both ends of its body. It looked like a snake dumbbell, but it was still alive. There was absolutely no way these two knots were tied by the snake writhing around on its own. They were as tight as rope knots. Taking into account the shortening of the knots, the snake must have been six feet long. We couldn't help but wonder who or what might have been in our camp while we were gone. The entire thing was mind-boggling. Artie took the snake and flung it into the woods, saying it would make a good meal for something. Now, maybe it's because I'm somewhat a city boy, but I couldn't see how Artie could be so stone-cold and unmoving about all of this. After spending a night around the campfire, BSing about everything and anything under the sun, we stoked the fire one last time and crawled into the tent. I had my semi laying by my side, and Artie had Harry next to his head. Artie was snoring, but I couldn't sleep a wink. I was too busy thinking about what had happened during the day. Sometime during the night, I started to hear some grunting or grumbling sounds outside the tent. It was hard to tell if they were near or far until a large shadow was cast between our tent and the fire. After a few moments, the shadow had completely darkened our tent's interior, followed by a large, deep growl. With this noise, the top of the tent started to move downward. Artie stopped snoring. With my eyes fixed on the shadow, I grabbed my gun, and before I could even think about shooting it, Artie sat up and squeezed off three successive rounds right through the tent. The flash and concussion were unbelievable, and the smell of gunpowder and smoke filled the confines of the tent, whatever this was, let out a scream, which I can only describe as being that of a T-Rex. It was so loud that it shook me. The side of the tent was burning, and the shadow had vanished. Whatever this was sounded like it was running away, screaming and bellowing as it did so. I unzipped the tent and burst out with my gun. There was no way I was going to die without a fight. Artie leapt out behind me, and the two of us stood there, heads moving left and right, looking and listening. This beast was still screaming off in the distance. I was sure that Artie had nailed this sucker with three forty-four caliber bullets at point-blank range. If it was a black bear, it would have dropped where it stood, but it didn't. It ran away. I asked Artie what the heck could limp, let alone run away, with three forty-four slugs in it. 
His answer was that bears can be tough mothers to take down. I had been thinking of doing exactly what he did. I was going to shoot too, but at that moment, I had thought about it being some loser dude in the woods playing a really bad and possibly deadly prank. Flashlights in hand, we started looking around for blood, but we found nothing, and the ground was so hard that we couldn't see any prints, not even those of our own boots. Beyond the glow of the fire, our surroundings were as black as black could be. It was extremely unnerving, to say the least. We got the fire going hot and heavy and stayed up the rest of the night. At this point, I was ready to call it quits, but I didn't want Artie to think that I didn't have any balls. I was the city flicker. We were supposed to have nuts of steel, right? According to our game plan, we had three days left. So, in the morning, Artie, seemingly having brushed off everything that happened during the night, suggested that we head over by the lake today. So we grabbed our spinning rods and our guns and headed off to the closest side of the lake. This time, his directions took us through a marginally more open tract of woods until we got nearer to the lake. Then the undergrowth thickened up like it had by the river. At any rate, we positioned ourselves along the lake's edge and started to throw some poppers and spinners getting into some very decent action quickly. The sun was out on the lake, and it was nice to be out from under the canopy of the pines. While we were fishing, I noticed something large and dark in color peering in and out of the bushes along the far side of the lake, first in one place and then in another. Every time it appeared, I pointed in its direction, asking Artie to look. Despite all of my prompting, he saw nothing, but I definitely saw something that was alive and moving, and I couldn't get my mind off the campsite incident last night. We must have been fishing for about six hours or so, taking a few food and drink breaks in between, when Artie said that we should head back and do a little varmint hunting before sunset. It sounded like a good idea to me, so we began the long walk back. By the time we had gotten back to the vicinity of the camp, we had been gone about eight or nine hours. As the camp came into view ahead of us, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. The entire campsite, including the truck, had been ransacked. There were things thrown up in the trees, and our cooler was completely flattened on the ground. It looked as though a steamroller had ran over it. Cosmetically speaking, the truck was in ruins. The cap looked like a tree had fallen on it, and both of the side windows were blown out. The cab had been smashed down so severely that we could not open the driver's side door, and there was no evidence of a log or anything that would or could have been used to do the degree of damage. The tailgate was partially torn from its hinges and bent under the rear bumper. The front winch was torn completely away from the truck. Nine sixteenth bolts and washers ripped cleanly out of the steel, and the other winch had all of the cable pulled out of it and was completely detached from the housing. Both of the aluminum steps were torn off, and we were only able to find one of them. Even then, it was in a mangled state. Thank God the cab had not been opened. The front of the hood from the grill inward looked as though it was hit with three or four blows from a 12-inch wide tree trunk. I say this because I have no other way to describe what we were looking at. And having said as much, there was not a single indicator such as bark, chips, or even marks on the vehicle which would have shown that part of a tree had actually been used to wreck the destruction. There were no small dents in the truck, just large, long, and wide blows to the metalwork. What bothered me most of all was the type of power that would be needed to flatten a large igloo cooler and the fact that the large bolts had been torn away from the truck, leaving a reverse dimple where they had been in the steel. It was insane. Whatever did this was not an individual or a group of individuals. No man could have done this. 
We said nothing to each other. There was nothing to say. We simply stood there, aghast. I jumped up into the bed of the truck and tried to push up on the broken cap in an effort to open things back up a bit. I was forcing my back against the broken roof of the cab, and as I worked my way into position, I noticed something very odd. Caught in the very end of one of the cracks in the fiberglass were several very long, dark-colored hairs. It looked as though something with hair had lost a few while their body slid or dragged off the roof. I showed them to Artie, and he said to me that it couldn't have been black bear fur. These strands were like eight or nine inches in length, which was way too long. We gathered up all the stuff we could and shoveled it under the remnants of the cab into the bed. We grabbed the tailgate and flexed it back and forth until we could twist it up and into the bed. When we came into camp, everything in the truck had been neatly organized, and as we were about to leave, it looked like an open trash can. Artie climbed up into the cab from the passenger side, which was not an easy task without the step, and started brushing the shattered glass out of the seat and everywhere else. The truck started right up and he let it run. I guess about an hour had gone by since we came back to the camp and it was time to get the heck out of there. It was a long ride in and it would be a longer ride out. As we left, I couldn't help feeling really bad for Artie in a number of ways. After all, I came on his invitation, and now his truck was in ruins, and we were leaving with our tails between our legs. What would his family think? What would anyone think? When we finally got clear of the woods, we started heading down the road. At some point, we saw a cop coming in the other way, and Artie waved him down. As he stopped, I couldn't see him because of the truck's height and the fact that he was on Artie's side. I heard him ask what happened to us. Artie shut the truck down as I jumped out and he followed. We spent about 45 minutes walking around the truck and telling the officer our tale. He wrote up an incident report and gave us a copy, saying that there are things in these woods that we know nothing about. Later on, as we entered Artie's property, Everyone came out to see the truck and talk to us about our ordeal. I was at dinner that evening that his father began telling us about what his father had said to him. He told us that the loggers and miners had spun many a yarn about a giant hairy creature that they had seen in the timber. He said his father told him that they would mess with and damage their equipment after the workers had left for the day. They would come back in the next morning and fine machinery bent and broken. He said that this was a regular happening for the workers, and that the men would speak of things being thrown into the camp without being able to see who or what threw them. At any rate, that's my story. Artie and I still speak to this day, and he actually rebuilt Littlefoot. Artie's father took the hairs that we retrieved and framed them in the den for family posterity. I haven't been back to visit Artie since. On to the next one. My name is Anik, and I'm an Inuit from the Kutsebu area of Alaska. I grew up in one of the tundra villages, which are the ancestral homes of my people and are scattered across the area. I haven't been home for several years, though I'm going for a visit in a couple of months. I met my husband when I worked in Kotzebu for Alaska Airlines. He was in the oil business. We married, raised our children there, then eventually returned to his people in Wyoming. It took a while for me to adjust, but now I'm happy there. The cold winters and barren hills remind me of home, and yet... We have none of the hardships of living in interior Alaska. I will tell you how it was growing up in a place where there are many more caribou than people. A place where the winters reach minus 60 degrees, with very little daylight for months on end. Where survival depends on how hard you work in the summer, catching and storing food, and 
on how much common sense you have. Many of my people are well adapted to the harsh climate, but I've seen many who weren't and who died out there, both Inuit and non-native. And to make things worse, we have the Bushmen, who will take every opportunity they can to steal your food and sometimes your life. Some of the younger Inuit will say they don't exist and are just outdated superstition. But I can tell everyone who has lived on the tundra for a very long believes in them. And I myself, well, I have actually seen them. When I was about nine years of age, we had a potential death crisis with my mother. One that meant we had to go to town. We lived in a tundra village far from Kotzebu, and the only time anyone went into town was to get supplies. In the spring and fall, today, people think very little of running in on their snow machines for a pizza. Okay, I exaggerate, but times have changed. When I was little, it was a long, arduous trip, one you didn't make unless you had to in the winter. Or there were many dangers along the way. I'll add that I was not the only one who had an experience with the Bushmen, like the one I'm about to relate. There are numerous stories in the tundra villages. We knew that in the winter, with the short days and bitter cold, we should stay home unless we had no choice, for it was dangerous out on the tundra in many ways. So, we suddenly found ourselves in the middle of a crisis. My father was unable to help, as he'd broken his arm when a snow machine turned over on him only a few weeks earlier. In fact, he was in Kotzebu recovering, staying there with his brother. That left me, my sister Suki, and my aunt Anya, who had come to stay with us while my dad was gone. My mom had diabetes and her insulin was running low, something we would never normally have let happen, except for all the attention being focused on my dad. When we realized she was low, it was almost too late. She only had a couple of days worth left. I might add that my mom was really bad about taking care of herself and never paid enough attention to things like that, so... Suki and I had made ourselves her caretakers, even though I was only nine and Suki was only twelve. We had to get to Kotzebu immediately. There were no bush planes coming our way, and the entire village had hunkered down for the winter. There was a reason everyone hunkered down. I remember seeing a thermometer at a friend's house that read minus 35 degrees, just a couple of nights before this all happened. When we realized what was going on, my aunt immediately made preparations to go to Kotzebu. We didn't think to ask someone else to go on our behalf, as it was a long trip and too much to ask. The Inuit are a very independent and self-reliant people, and we just saw the task needing to be done and set out to do it. Back then, the women were just as skilled with snow machines and survival skills as were the men. Now it's different, and people seem to be more specialized. My aunt prepared the snow machines, making sure we had extra gas cans in the sled, as well as plenty of food for the trip. We also took a pan and a small propane stove along to stop and melt ice if we got thirsty. It was useless to try and carry water as it froze almost immediately. But sometimes when it was cold, even the propane stove wouldn't work. My sister would stay behind to keep an eye on mom. We had two days to make the trip. One that usually took a full day one way. We would be traveling in the dark most of the time. So my aunt made sure we had an extra lamp for the snow machine as well as flashlights for ourselves. She also loaded in some extra caribou hides for warmth and to take for some groceries. 
We wore our warmest fur coats and mukluks. When we left, I wanted to cry, for I had the strangest sense of foreboding, like I would never see my mother and sister again. I gave them both extra long hugs, and they laughed, saying I was being a silly girl. But I could tell from the look on their faces that they too were very worried. Finally, as we were actually pulling away, my mom signaled for us to stop. She came out and put a small handgun in the deep pocket of my parka, telling me not to hesitate if I needed to use it. This really hammered home how worried she really was. We took off, the snow machine making a racket as it powered over the icy snow, and the village was soon gone over a rise in the tundra. I remember feeling very desolate as I rode along behind my aunt, holding on to her warmth, wanting to cry, worried about my mom and also the others. We made good time. My aunt followed the poles in the snow that the men put out each winter for guidance, since the tundra all looks the same when snowy. It was easy to get lost during a whiteout. The poles lined the trail between villages, and are color-coded, with white and orange indicating a good trail, red meaning rough ice road, and blue meaning thin ice or open water. Green means there's a shelter nearby. Sometimes a marker would disappear or blow away, but one could usually go back to the previous one and figure out the right direction. Some Inuit have an amazing sense of direction and can go anywhere, anytime, but that was a rare trait. Of course, now people can just use their GPS. It was soon dark, but we were lucky, for it was a half-moon night and not as black as usual. I was tired and my aunt let me ride in the sled, all wrapped up in caribou hide. I still remember leaning back and watching the northern light dance in the sky above me. It's a memory I'll never forget gliding over the icy tundra and wrapped in soft fur, watching the magical light. Before long, I heard a pack of wolves singing in the distance. It's actually a cherished memory now that I'm older, but back then it was scary. It was a long trip, but we finally made it to Kutsebu. I'll never forget the look of surprise and concern on my dad's face when he saw us. He told me later he thought that maybe mom had died. We were exhausted after the long day of constant travel. My uncle Siluk took care of the snow machine, making sure it was full of gas, and Aunt Opik made us a hot dinner. I was soon asleep, while my dad tried to get a hold of my mom's doctor to get more insulin. The next day, we were up early, everything ready to go for we had a long day ahead of us. My relatives had obtained the insulin, and after a hot breakfast, I hugged my dad goodbye and got into the sled. I still had the feeling of doom that had followed me all day yesterday. We were soon back on the tundra, and I could tell my aunt was feeling a sense of urgency from the speed she was going. Like me, I knew she just wanted to get home and put this all behind us. I was now crowded in the sled by the supplies we were taking back. Lots of dried fish and berries from my other aunt, as well as bannock, store-bought foods, paper goods, and even some candies for the kids. And, of course, the insulin, which I carried next to me in my shirt pocket under my parka so it wouldn't freeze. The day wore on and on, and it was soon dark again, even though it was only afternoon. It felt colder to me than the day before, but I knew it was because the caribou skins were gone. As we went along, everything took on a forever kind of quality, a feeling like we had always been riding over the frozen tundra on a snow machine in the dark, and that we would forever be. Maybe we died, I thought, and this was what the afterlife was like. But suddenly, from the dark, 
came a howl that made my teeth chatter. I could tell from the way my aunt sped up the snow machine that she'd heard it too. Finally, after another hour or so, my aunt Anya stopped, asking me to pour her some of the sweet hot tea my other aunt had put into a big thermos. She drank it quickly and ate a few bites of dried fish and bannock and soon had the machine going again at top speed, much faster than I felt was prudent. But I wasn't going to say anything, having heard that howl, a howl like nothing I'd heard before. Before long, I started smelling the faint odor of gasoline. My sense of doom returned in full force, as I knew something was wrong with our snow machine. Hopefully, we would make it back. We were only a couple of hours away from home at this point. It was then that I thought I saw something in the shadows, not far away, running as if trying to stay up with us. It was tall and had long legs, but I couldn't make it out very clearly. I knew it had something to do with the howl I'd heard earlier. Everything felt eerie and strange. How could anything be as fast as a snow machine, especially one going as hard as my aunt was pushing this one? I was warm in my thick parka, but I couldn't help but shiver. I wondered if my aunt had seen it, but I doubted she had, as her eyes were focused on the frozen ice and the swales in the tundra, trying hard to see beyond the light of the snow machine and follow the flags. I didn't dare say anything to her, as I didn't want to distract her, but I desperately wanted to be riding behind her, feeling her warmth against me, a sort of comfort. I could now see the figure, and it was much closer. It acted like it was no longer trying to hide, like it knew I'd seen it. It ran a bit behind and to the side, where it would be difficult for my aunt to see it while driving. As we drove along, I could make out clearer and clearer as it got closer and closer. It was taller than my father, much taller, and wore what looked like a robe of thick black fur. Either that, or it had long black hair all over. It didn't look anything like a bear, which my aunt told me later she had initially thought it was when she first saw it. It had a huge head and wide shoulders and long arms. Suddenly, the machine started sputtering and it soon stopped completely, the engine dead. I now knew for certain we were going to die. They would find our bodies frozen into the tundra. I looked back and the figure had stepped into the shadows, waiting and watching. Why didn't it come for us then? I'll never know. Maybe it thought my aunt would see it and shoot it. My aunt tried over and over to start the machine, but afraid of running the battery down, she stopped and sat there and thought. I could tell she was thinking of all the times she'd been out with the snow machine that wouldn't start. Usually, though, my uncle was there to help. Or someone with another machine was there, so you weren't totally stuck, as it could be a matter of life and death. Do you smell gas? I asked. You mean we're out of gas? We haven't come far enough, she replied. Maybe we have a leak. I keep smelling gas. We need to hurry, auntie. Please put in more gas. I nodded my head in the direction of the figure. Even though it was in the shadows, I knew my aunt thought from the way she let out a gasp. To her credit, she was very level-headed and quickly took a gas can from the sled, filling the machine. I could tell she was seriously worried. She examined the gas tank with a flashlight, then peeled a small piece of skin from one of her caribou gloves, spit on it, and pushed it against a small hole where the gas was leaking. It froze in place instantly. Now filled with gas, the snow machine started right up. I jumped from the sled behind my aunt into the machine, holding on tight, and we were soon on our way again, going at a steady pace. I knew my aunt didn't want to go as fast as she'd been going and was now feeling more cautious. With the creature following us, if something happened to stop us, 
we could be in grave danger. Now able to make out a small cluster of big round rocks we called the round people, I knew the village was maybe a half hour away at most. I could feel my aunt relax a little when she also saw the rock. I was afraid to turn and look, but upon doing so, my breath caught in my throat. The creature who I now knew to be a bushman was right behind us. I grabbed onto my aunt even tighter, causing her to turn and to look. She gasped and immediately opened the throttle. The machine took off so fast that the sled actually caught air. So much for being cautious. We were now flying, heading for home in record time. The cold air bit into my cheeks and forehead, and I let go of my aunt with one hand and held my glove up to my face. Now the sled jerked a little and I turned. The bushman was trying to grab onto it. It must want what was in it. I heard rumors of bushmen robbing people's sleds, and I was now seeing it firsthand. It was hard to believe that anything could keep up with the snow machine throttle, but this thing was easily staying right behind us. If it managed to grab onto the sled, the added weight would probably cause the sled to tip back and the snow machine to crash. My aunt suddenly started weaving, trying to throw it off, but my sled was soon almost out of gas, so I brought it all straight again. All of my premonitions of something terrible happening were coming true. I knew my aunt and I would soon die, but what was worse, my mom would also die from not having the insulin she needed. It was that thought that made me remember the small gun my mom had stuffed into my parka pocket when we'd left. I'd forgotten all about it. Because my parka was so big and heavy, the added weight and bulk I hadn't even noticed before. I stuck my hand into my pocket, making sure the gun was still there, and then carefully pulled it out. I knew how to shoot, a skill I'd learned very young as hunting was our primary source of food, but also for the hides and bones we used for so many things. And now... I could hear the footsteps of the bushmen pounding nearby, now audible above the noise of the snow machine. The bushman was large and heavy, and he must be right next to us, I thought, as I undid the safety on the gun. Without even looking back, I pointed the gun back behind me and pulled the trigger. The recoil almost knocked it from my hand. The sound was so loud, my aunt almost lost control of the snow machine, but I yelled, Go! Go! And she kept going. As I looked back, I could see the bushman had stopped and was standing, looking as if in shock. I knew I hadn't hit him, as he didn't appear to be in any kind of pain. He stood there, watching as we disappeared into the darkness. I don't remember much else except handing my mom the insulin and crawling into my warm bed. I know there was much discussion of the incident the next day and everywhere I went for some time afterward. People wanted to ask me about it, but I never wanted to talk much. It seemed too far away and like it hadn't really happened. It took a long time before I would go out into the dark, even in the village and I took to practice shooting until I became a crack shot. I wanted to be prepared in case I ever saw another Bushman. And when I would see the northern lights, I would sometimes have to go inside and make myself relax, as I would get very tense. Sometimes people would laugh and make light of my fears until I told them the story. I eventually got married and left the tundra. And though I missed it and my relatives deeply, I never missed worrying about the Bushmen. Years later now, my parents are gone. And when I think of going back to Katsebu and my village, it seems like another world and another life. I actually really like where we live in Wyoming. My husband likes to snowmobile, as you call it down here. But I never go with him. I've tried it once and the memory of the Bushman was just too heavy 
so I prefer to stay home. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!